Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode. I am joined by a very special guest, Mr. Hubert Jolie, the former CEO, chairman, and president of Best Buy. Mr. Jolie is considered by many in this business world as one of the most accomplished and innovative CEOs of all time. Mr. Jolie is currently a professor at Harvard Business School and serves on many boards such as Johnson & Johnson, Best Buy, and Ralph Lauren. He is not only a renowned CEO, but he is also a writer. Recently releasing his first book last month in May called The Heart of Business, which has now become a Wall Street Journal and U.S. Today bestseller. In his book, he recalls his early career, his time as CEO of Best Buy, how he saved the company on the brink of bankruptcy, and his biggest lessons during his seven years as CEO. Mr. Jolly has become a champion of a new way of empowering employees to become successful and at the same time growing corporate revenue and profits. On today's episode, we will be learning about how Mr. Jolie successfully turned around Best Buy, finding purpose in meeting at work, and his views on leadership. Excited would be an understatement for how I feel about today's conversation. I hope you guys are ready. So without further ado, let's go. Mr. Jolie, welcome and thank you for joining the podcast. Well, Logan, thank you for having me. And you said I turn around Best Buy, I would say. Uh, about 125,000 of my best, fr best friends did, you know, this was yes. a team effort for sure. Great. Now, before we dive deeper into your best part career, I kind of like to discuss your early career. So how did you start your career in business and how did that eventually lead to your career at Carlson companies and eventually to Best Buy? So there was no plan. <laughs> when you look at the jobs I've had, I've been a consultant with McKinsey and Company, which is a major consulting firm. I was in IT services. I was the CEO of a video games company. So for any gamer out there, I greenlit World of Warcraft in 2000, which I think is cool. And then I was uh, you know, in travel uh, with Carlson Burgundy Travel, in hospitality with Carlson, and then Best Buy. So there was no logic from a sector standpoint. At every point in my journey, it was all about doing the best I could, you know, where I was, doing, you know, giving my best. And then every move was based on a relationship with somebody I'd met before and who had a need and thought that I could help them with the next opportunity. So uh, I've learned one lesson from a good friend of mine, Jim Citrin, who said the best leaders, I'm not saying I'm one of the best leaders, but the best leaders don't climb to the top. They do not climb to the top. They are carried to the top. They do their best along the way and then good things happen. That's what I would say. Great. Now, you know, I'm curious, I think most of my audience members are, why did you decide to leave Carlson Companies, especially because it was such a good company, it was consistently making good profits, it was hitting its quarter, quarterly revenues. Um, and why did you leave to become the CEO of Best Buy, especially in the light of Amazon dominating many retailers, and possibly Best Buy going out of business? Yes. So some of my friends, Logan, in Minneapolis, when they learned that I was taking the Best, job, best Buy job, thought it was uh, crazy. You know, and uh, it came at a time when I was open to leave Carlson for a whole variety of reasons. But still, when I got the call from my friend, Jim Citrin, same person that I just mentioned, I said, Jim, you're crazy, right? I know nothing about retail and this place is a mess. But he said, look, they're not looking for a retailer. They're looking for somebody who can bring a fresh perspective. And, you know, you've done turnarounds and transformations of companies so this, this would be great for you. And so do me a favor, look at it. So he didn't ask me to commit, but he asked me to commit to look at it, which I did. And what I saw, Logan, is that, yes, everybody thought we were going to die because of Amazon. But in my due diligence, looking at the opportunity, I, I found two things. One, the world actually needed Best Buy. Because as customers, for some of our purchases, it's helpful to actually be... Uh, able to go to a store and touch, feel, and see the products and talk to a human being. And to the vendors, so the tech companies like uh, Microsoft and Samsung and Sony uh, and Apple, they need a place where to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars of product development. Uh, because, you know, there again, people need to see before they can buy. And so that was a good combination. And then what I saw is that our problem had nothing to, because we did have problems, but they had nothing to do with Amazon. They were all self-inflicted. Our prices were too high. Our online shopping experience was not good. Our speed of shipping was not good. The store experience had deteriorated. Our cost structure was too high. So the good news with all of these problems, I didn't need to call Jeff Bezos and say, stop bothering us. 
you know, we could we could fix that. And sometimes in life, that's a good lesson, right? Before blaming others, look at what you can do. I call it self-help. And so I thought there was enough assets to be able to, you know, do this, this turnaround and save this iconic, great American iconic company. So that's what we did. Great. Now, I know there was a specific strategy. You called it the Renew Blue Plan. So I'm curious... You implemented at Best Buy to turn around the company. Uh, could you elaborate more on what the Renew plan was and how were you able to implement it so successfully? Uh, thank you. So one of the ideas I have is that if you're going to, you don't have a strategy until the strategy has a name. So I always give a name to a strategy. So Renew Blue was the first phase of our turnaround of our resurgence. And blue, why blue? Because as you know, because you guys go to stores, right? It's the blue shirts, right? The Best Buy associates wear a blue shirt. And I felt that, you know, Best Buy had a great pass and it was a matter of rejuvenating, renewing, you know, what was great about the company. And mostly it was about fixing what was broken. So I was getting a lot of advice from investors and analysts, financial analysts saying, cut, cut, cut. You're going to have to close stores, fire a lot of people. I looked, you know, all of the stores were profitable, so there was no point in closing them. And firing people almost implies that people are the problem. I thought that people were going to be the solution. So the approach to, to, to this Renew Blue plan was very human-centric. Of course, I can talk to you about what we did. You know, we align our prices with Amazon. We, you know, our blue shirts can match Amazon prices. So we took price off the table. So it's not even a consideration anymore. We invested in the online shopping experience, in our speed of shipping. Now we say we ship same day uh, or next day, so as fast as Amazon. We invested in the experience in the stores, in the blue shirts. We gave them the tools that they needed. Um, and then we, we partnered with all of these tech companies, allowing them to have like a store within our store. So as a customer, it's great because you can see all of the products under one roof. And then it's good for us because you know, we make money off of that. So that's the what we did. But more important is the how we did it. And that was completely human-centric. Logan, I spent my first, my first week on the job working in a store in St. Cloud, Minnesota, so that I could listen to the frontliners because they knew what was working well and what was not working well. So I just had to ask, you know, yeah. they had all of, the, uh, all of the answers. I also had to make sure to change the team at the top. Oftentimes in a company, if things are not going well, you have to look at the top. Don't blame the frontliners, blame people at the top. So we had to replace a few people in the executive team. Uh, and then instead of cutting, 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 we focused on how can we grow the revenue? It's amazing what revenue growth can do for a company. And to the extent that we had to cut costs, which we did, we first focus on what I call non-salary expenses, which is, all of the elements of the cost structure that have nothing to do with people. Uh, and at most companies, that's the bulk of the, of the cost structure. So as an example, to make it concrete, at Best Buy, we sell a lot of TVs, right? They are large, they are thin, so they break. We would break for about $200 million worth of TVs over there. Okay. Now, if you can reduce that loss by improving the packaging or the design of the product or how we carry them, that's good for uh, everybody. Uh, so that's an example. And you only cut headcount as a last uh, resort. And then it was all about creating energy. So there's a big leadership lesson here. You know, sometimes we think that leaders are there because they're the smartest and they're going to come up with the right answer. Uh, you know, the strategy we did was not that complicated. I think that, that you need to be smart, but not that smart, which was more important was creating energy and mobilizing the 125,000 employees of the company. So in physics, maybe you guys are learning that uh, energy cannot be created, right? But in a human organization, energy can be created, right? You've seen leaders or friends, you know, when they walk into the room, all of a sudden the energy level goes up, right? So as leaders, that's what we do. So it was about co-creating the plan with the team. It was about getting going, celebrating the early wins. And if there was problems, be candid, let's talk about them. Oh, this, is, this did not work out as intended. We need to rework this. Let's get back you know, together to, to fix that. So that was in essence the, uh, the what, but importantly the how of Renew Blue, which was the first phase of our journey. 
Well, and I want to mention quickly mention that you often stress in your book that you basically invested in people, how to work on their management skills, um, their customer service skills. And I'm curious, why, why is it so important to stress that people are really at the heart of business? Yes. Uh, they make a company successful rather than prioritizing profits like most, yes. most banks try to do. Yeah, so Logan, you're hitting on a very important point. Sometimes we get confused. Of course, we need to make money in a business. But for me, making money, the profit is an outcome. It's an outcome you're going to make profit if you have good people who are properly trained and equipped and, and energized. If you have customers who are happy and want more, and you know, if you have the good cost structure, then you'll make profits. But the lesson is that you have to treat profit as an outcome. And so, for example, maybe one day, uh, or maybe already today, right? You, you, you have a business and you, every month you want to manage performance, right? So you get together with your team as you look at, at, at performance, what's going on in the business. If you start with financial results, how much money you've made, you'll spend the entire meeting talking about it. And the suggestion I had from a client of mine when I was a consultant was don't do that. Start with people and organization then go to customers and products and business and finish with profits. Your, your chief financial officer, your finance guy will always make sure that you spend enough time on finance. But if you flip it, you won't spend time on people or customers. So I thought that was a good lesson. And the other thought that this client had shared with me, if you think about, it's the same for your life, right? What's the ultimate goal of our life? You know, why do we, how do we want to live our life? When we retire, what are we going to be the most excited about, the most proud of? It's for each of us to decide. For most people, of course, we need to make money, but it's not the ultimate goal, right? I don't know when maybe our, our audience can think about this, right? Is it to make money or is it, for me, it's do something good in the world, right? Treat others well and be remembered because I've been a good person. So for me in business, it's the same. Of course, we need to make money. But business is more about, you know, what purpose do we have? What difference, what positive difference do we want to make it in the lives of our employees, our customers, the communities in which we operate, and of course, the shareholders. And I think if you think about business like this, I think business has the opportunity to be a force for good and be more than for profit, which in today's environment is very important, right? Employees want to work for good companies. Customers want to deal with responsible businesses. And, and you know, the, the planet, you know, we have environmental issues, right? If business pollute the planet, we won't have a business, you know, in the future. So I think these are thoughts to that certainly govern our thinking at Best Buy. Great. Now, uh, what I want to do is really quickly is kind of go back and look over your seven years as CEO. So I was curious, what were the greatest challenges in turning around Best Buy's troubles? And ultimately, what was the greatest accomplishment you're most proud of when you completed the turnaround? Yeah, the most proud, I'll start with the most proud of uh, Logan. And, and, and that came actually early on when he, at a big meeting of the company, there's a store general manager you know, who approached me and said, uh, thank you. Thank you for saving Best Buy. I told him I didn't do it alone, but he said, still, thank you. Thanks to that, my children will be able to go to college. Right? And I said, oh, my God, let me go back to work. Right, I want more children to go to, uh, to college. Another thing I'm very proud of is uh, how we did this turnaround, trying to you know, have a positive impact on all, you know, you'll hear this word, stakeholders, right? So the employees, the customers, the community, the planet, we reduced our carbon footprint by more than 60% now. Right? And then maybe the proudest thing is passing the baton to my successor, who is a wonderful CEO and a wonderful woman, Corey Barry. Uh, so passing the baton to the next generation of leaders who are taking you know, the, the, the company to the next level. So that makes me feel that we've built something that's sustainable. Now, most challenging, there was so many challenges along the way, right? If I give you the impression, Logan, that this was a walk in the park, this was not. So I'll give you just one, uh, one example. In January of 2014, so about a year and a half after I had started, we, we had started to have good results, but unfortunately in November, December, 2013, our revenue was behind, was below our expectations. 
So we missed our expectations. We missed our guidance. You may hear this word guidance. This is what companies tell the market, Wall Street, what number they're going to hit. And so we knew we needed to announce this to the market, to the investors. And we knew that they wouldn't like these numbers, right? In fact, on the day we announced the share price, which had gone from $11 to $39, went back down to 26. So in one day, we lost a third of our value. That was not great. So the day before we announced these results, I got the uh, officers or the senior leaders of the company together. And we shared the, the numbers with them. They knew it sort of because they had been part of the, you know, the work, but we gave them the final numbers. And I asked ourselves this question, tomorrow morning, how do we want to show up? Do we want to show up saying, okay, everybody who thought that Best Buy was going to die was right, we surrender, right? That's option one. Option two is, gee, you know, we've made a few mistakes, you know, and we can learn from these mistakes. So we could ask these questions, right? Why do we fall, Bruce? You know that movie, right? Yes. Uh, the Dark Knight. And uh, uh, it's so that we can pick ourselves up. It's Batman. And there's also a great movie, you know, any given Sunday with Al Pacino. You may have seen that scene at halftime where Al Pacino delivers this, I mean, you can Google it, right? Uh, amazing motivational speech. And we said, no, we want to get back on the saddle. We want to go after these inches to quote Al Pacino. And so, and we did, we told the market we made mistakes, self-included, always blame yourself first, right? Before you blame others. Uh, and, and it's not about blaming, it's just you know, being real. And then we corrected and we got back on the settle. Now the share price is at 115 or something like this. And so for me, the, 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 the lesson is that as leaders, we shouldn't be like thermometers where our mood goes up and down with the share price or the, you know, the weather. We should be like thermostats and we should be there to create energy within the organization and it's okay, you know, we're gonna fumble. It's not linear, you know, in all of our lives, we make mistakes, we fumble, but then it's about what we decide to do then. So for me, that was the leadership lesson. I guarantee you, Logan, there was other challenging moments, but uh, in the interest of time, we'll focus on, on what I actually go through them in the book, right? I'm not shy about, because I think it's important that we admit we're not perfect and that, uh, you know, there's struggles in life. Great. Now, I'd like to transition to discuss your book and the business and human concepts you believe in and implemented at Best Buy that serve as core principles of successful business. Um, so to start off, what inspired you to write your book, The Heart of Business, and what do you hope to accomplish from it? Yes. So if we step back and, you know, you'll tell me whether you agree with me, Logan. I, last year, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, even though I'm an eternal optimist, I had to admit to myself, look, the world we live in is not working perfectly, right? We have this health crisis, we have an economic crisis, we have societal issues, we have racial issues, environmental issues, geopolitical tension. <laughs> you have to be lying to yourself to, and say things are working perfectly. Maybe for a few people, but for the rest of us, no. And so what's the definition of madness? do the same thing and hope for a different outcome. Uh, that's Albert Einstein. And so what has been the approach in the business world for many years? Uh, for me, it's been this excessive, almost obsessive focus on profits and too much of an approach that uh, is about top-down management. So a bunch of smart people at the top telling everybody at the company what to do. I don't think that works. I mean, the excessive focus on profit is dangerous. And uh, you could ask yourself, Logan, do you like to be told what to do? You need to answer. No, no, do not. <laughs> the do worst not. thing, it's, it's the worst thing in the world because it feels like you it, it feels like you don't matter and that you're kind of just this this kind of worker that's just exactly. working hard and you don't get anything in return. Exactly. And so, you know, I remember my first job when I was 16, I was working in a supermarket in France. I was putting price tags on vegetable cans. I was completely disengaged. You know, to get engaged, we need to connect what gives us energy, right? Because motivation is intrinsic, comes from us, right? And then we, need, we get to decide whether something is going to be excited or not. And so telling somebody what to do is not going to, you know, leverage 
uh, what, what drives people. And so my sense in, in, in short is that there's an urgent need for a refoundation of business around better principles. And for me, these principles are the idea that at the heart of business, you know, we have to pursue a noble purpose in the world. So do good things to other people. That we have to place people at the center as the source right, of the business and creating the environment where every one of us can feel that this is a magical environment, right? We, we have a spring in our step, step and we, we're ready to walk through walls because it's exciting work. Then we have to embrace all of the stakeholders, so the, the employees, the customers, the community, and the shareholders, the planet, in a way that is aligned and then treat profit as an outcome. Now, this vision is shared by most people now. But what's hard is that uh, it requires that we rethink pretty much every way we have been thinking about business, how we lead, how we mobilize people, how we define our strategies. And because this is, these are things I've been thinking about and, and, and of course using for the last 30 years, and because the, the, the delightfully surprising and surprisingly, surprisingly delightful resurgence of Best Buy gives me credibility, right? When, when, because the share price went from, just to take the share price, went from 11 to 110 or something. You know, people are not asking, what was he smoking, right? At least yes. people are listening. Yeah. And they didn't smoke anything illegal, did not inhale. Um, and, and so I wanted to, my goal is, is to really to provide a guide a very practical guide for every leader at all levels. And by the way, all of us are leaders because at a minimum, we're leaders of our lives, right? A guide on how to move in that direction of leading from a place of purpose and with humanity. So as you know, because you've read it, the book is full of very concrete examples, practical advice, also self-reflective question. At the end of each chapter, you get to think about you know, how you're gonna approach this or this or that. So, so I, I hope it's useful as a guide to many, many, as many leaders as possible so that together we can create a future that's, uh, that does not exist yet, frankly, but that's more sustainable and more just and more fun than what we have today. Oh, I completely agree. I think, I think a great example of companies really just only caring about profits was during 08, uh, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, when they yes. collapsed, they did fraud um, yes. and they only care about making money. Yes. rather than actually helping people grow their money. So I think that's a great example. Yep. Um, so moving on to the next question, uh, for those who haven't read your book, how would you define meaning and purpose in a job? How do you discover them both? Ah, so in fact, the, the, the first part of the book is about this question in a sense, right? Why do we work? And that's a question that all of us get to ask ourselves. Now, of course, you know, we need to make some money. I know my first job when I was working in that supermarket, my goal was to buy get some money to buy a bicycle so that was the and so we need to make some money to feed ourselves feed the family get the children through college and things like this but beyond that how do we think about work and it's for each one of us listening and everybody in the world to decide do we see work as a curse because some idiot sinned in paradise right <laughs> if you believe the, the bible um or um is, uh, or is it, uh, so in French, I'm thinking because in French, the word work is travail, which comes from Latin tripalium, which is an instrument of torture. So do we see work as torture? Or different view is, do we see work as something we do so that we can do something else that's more fun? Like, you know, for example, uh, as we speak, France and Switzerland are uh, meeting in the European uh, soccer cup, you know? <laughs> And, and a tournament. So watching a football game or going fishing with some friends or whatever the case may be. Uh, or is work part of our quest for meaning as individual, quest, part of our quest for fulfillment? And I love the Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran who said, work is love made visible. So we find a, 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 a you know, we are clear about in our life what drives us, what gives us energy and we find a, a job, a company where we can connect what drives us with the work. But if that is possible, then that's magical. And so this question of purpose and meaning is, yeah, what, what do we wanna do with our lives? How do we wanna be remembered? One of the things we ask at 
Harvard Business School to the new CEOs when they come to a, a workshop. And maybe you guys can think about this as well. We ask them to write down and share with each other their retirement speech. I have a good friend of mine, John Donahoe, who's the, the CEO of Nike. Um, is uh, when he graduated, he wrote his retirement speech. He always kept it. And every year he goes back to it, right? And see whether he's living the life that he wants to live. And the beauty about business and work, I think, is that, uh, you know, it's a choice, but because we spend so much of our life working, if we can find a job where we, we do things that are meaningful to us, that are impactful and joyful, then that's, you know, that's not a bad thing. Great. Now, I, I want to touch base on this certain event that you brought up in your book. I remember a part of your book when you mentioned a story about Jordan and his broken T-Rex uh, and how Best Buy employees, instead of bringing out a new T-Rex, they decided to perform surgery on the new toy and they came back to Jordan and they, quote unquote, cured, cured him uh, and sent him out with a bright smile. And I think that's what you wanted to replicate in all Best Buy. Best Buy employees, and you know, I connect with that so much because I'm I'm still a kid, right? I'm still a kid. Same here. Same yeah, here. and I think the amazing thing is, I realized they were just passionate about their job. They loved working for Best Buy. They were just passionate. That's the main thing. So my question is, from what you've seen throughout your career, what would was someone with passion, motivation act compared to someone who is just doing their job for money or a paycheck? And why is passion for one's job or career so important? Yeah, and to finish answering your previous question, in the book, there's some guidelines or some thoughts or some questions to help, you know, uh, identify over time our purpose and what gives, uh, gives meaning to our lives. And, and by the way, that's going to be a long journey, right? It, I, I, you know, it took me several decades really to land on, on my purpose. So this is a lifelong uh, pursuit. But, uh, you know, when we are in a situation, and you may have found it, if not at work, you know, maybe in a group of friends, right? We're in a situation where we, we are excited about the activities. We're excited about the people we work with. We are excited about the difference we can make. The sky is the limit in terms of what we can do, which, is, which includes, by the way, back to your point about not, being like, not liking being told what to do, right? If, we, if we're told what to do, eh, we're just gonna comply. If we decide, you know, like these two associates in the store who said, no, we're not gonna get him a replacement. We're, we're gonna cure the T-Rex toy, which, and when I saw that, when I heard that story, Logan, I, I, I thought, this is why our performance is accelerating so much, right? Our revenue line was really, uh, getting faster and faster. And I said, that's, that's because we have 100,000 people giving their best to the, to the job. So to your question, what happens when that happens? Well, one, the, as human beings, we're much more excited about, about the job. I think in this case, as you pointed out, you know, Jordan, the customer, the little boy, uh, was so happy, so you create happiness. By the way, you know, if you create a situation where your customer are truly happy, They'll come back. Yeah, you'll build loyalty. So at some point I said, actually, Best Buy is not a retailer. We're in the happiness business, right? And at some point we said, we want to build a company that the employees will love, that the customers will love, that you know, the vendors will love working with us. The community will like us as well because we're good citizens in the places where we have operations and the, the shareholders will love. And so when, when you have that at scale and it's sustainable and it's real, you get what I call irrationally good performance. Performance that defies logic. And you say, this shouldn't be happening. But that's because of this magic that, that is uh, in the heart of so many of our employees that you have, you know, this happening. Now, don't get me wrong, Best Buy is, is not perfect, right? If regularly, as, even though I'm no longer working at the company, I still get emails of customers saying, oops, <laughs> that didn't go so well. So. And then we tried to, uh, we're not perfect, but we tried to help them with whatever issue we've created for them. <laughs> no, I could, I could definitely relate to that. And um, in your book, you also mentioned four elements that can help find a, per a person's purpose. Find what you love. What are you good at? 
what the world needs and what you can get paid for. Uh, could you elaborate more on these four elements and what they mean and how they each play a key role in helping us find meaning in a job? Yeah, because it's it's really the UN FAST, right? In, in describing that, but this is at the intersection of these four elements that we, we find our sweet spot, right? Because if one of the elements is missing, so the four to repeat, right? So it's what we love doing, what we are passionate about, what we are uniquely good at, what the world needs, and what we can get paid for and make money from. So if we're missing the last element, making money, it's hard, it's going to be hard to have this as a job, right? If we're not, if this is not something that the world needs, we're not going to go far with it. If we're not passionate about it, if we don't love it, and eh, we're not going to give it our best. And if it's not something that we're uniquely good at, then it could be a nice dream. Like I would love, you know, to play Wimbledon and win. You know, the world needs a winner. So that's good. I love tennis. I would make a lot of money, but I'm not good at this. So forget about it. I'm not going to be Roger Federer at any point in time in the future. So I think these four elements, because the question of finding our meaning and our purpose, and that's a bit of a daunting question. So the, the idea of having these four dimensions is a way to uh, help us find this meaning because we can do an inventory, of, all right? Uh, every one of us, what are the things I love versus not? What are the things I'm good at? And then what does the world need, right? And then how we can make money. These are, so it allows us to break down the problem and then at the intersection. And sometimes it takes time, right? Because the way for us to find out whether we love a job, you know, you have to try sometimes, right? You don't know. Because sometimes you have an idea. So, for example, Logan, when I was 10, uh, I wanted to be a vet, right? Because my godfather was a vet. So I would go out with him and we would take care of cows and dogs and fleas. And, you know, right? yeah. But it sounded cool. But after a while, I said, eh, that's not really what I want to do. You know? So no, trial and error that. is absolutely fine. Great. Um, now, one of my favorite investors, Mr. Leon Koopman, always says, do what you love, love what you do. Yes. I'm curious, which element do you feel is more important along a person's journey to finding their purpose? Should, should one prioritize one over the others? So give me the two again. So I have time to think. Find what you love, what are you good at, what the world needs, and what you can get paid for. From the four? So it depends of the time in your career. Okay. So in the first stage of, and I have a good, my good friend, Jim Citrin, that's the third time I'm mentioning. He wrote this great book. So everybody can get this book. I highly recommend it. The Career Playbook by Jim Citrin, C-I-T-R-I-N. He's a great guy. He says, in the early stage of your career, maybe in your 20s, the priority is to build your capabilities, All right? Because if you don't build your capabilities, you're not gonna have a great foundation. So, you know, when I graduated from school, I was the lowest paid, you know, member of my class. So money was not a factor. It was building skills that was really a factor. Now, over time, being in a space where there's needs in the world, that's really helpful because that will create more opportunities. So if the, if the sea level is rising, that's helpful. And then I might stage in my career. So I'm 61, I'll turn 62 in, in a couple of months. You know, having been a CEO, I've made some money. So making money is the last thing I care about. It's all about, you know, how I can help the next generation of leaders, you know, uh, be, you know to be the best leader they can be. So I think that the, 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 the weight varies. Now, at a higher level, what has not changed for me is my main purpose, which is, you know, the way I've defined it, Logan, is, I want to do my best to try to make a positive difference on people around me and use the platform I have to try to make a positive difference in the world. And so that's always true. That doesn't define my job, but that defines what's important to, to me in my life. Great. Now, I do want to talk about a pretty important topic, I think, relatable in everyone's life, the idea of being perfect. Now, I'm curious, why is aiming for perfection not always the best route to go, especially when it comes to helping a business prosper? Yeah, so I suffered from that disease because I was confusing performance and perfection. Performance is really important. You know, when you 
when you run a business, you want customers to be happy. You want the products to have no defect. But if you focus on perfection, uh, that you get in trouble. Why? Well, the first thing is, as human, as a human being, something that applies to me, I'm not perfect. So if I'm really going for perfection, I'm never going to be kind with myself, right? I'm going to hate myself for not being perfect. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to work on a team. And on that team, there's going to be other human beings. If I'm going for perfection, I'm going to see these other human beings who are not perfect as an obstacle to perfection. And to, to yeah, exactly. And so in contrast, if I'm able to be vulnerable and say, this is what I'm good at, but you know, this is an area where I need help. And if everybody does this, then we can support each other. And it creates more genuine, more authentic human connections, human relationships. And then we can do great things together. And nobody's, you know, making you believe that they're perfect and that they're the best things in sliced bread. So it took me time to understand this. There's an entire chapter in the book around this, but I, I highly recommend to, to not be driven by perfection, by uh, by performance, yes, but not perfection. Great. Now, I, I want to move on and transition to the topic of leadership as it is a cr- critical component of a company's success. So I want to get to know, how would you define leadership and what makes a great leader in your opinion? Uh, and yeah, it makes a great leader. This is, you become a leader, right? So while all leaders were born, none of us were born a leader. So we get the opportunity to grow and become a leader. Now, I think the, there's a lot of myth about leadership, certainly that I grew up with. It's the idea that the, the leader is, is super powerful, is like a superhero, is like a demigod, you know, in the Greek uh, tradition, uh, is there to save the day. Uh, there's also some traps with leadership about, you know, you see too many leaders who are driven by power, fame, glory, or money. Nobody wants to follow these leaders anymore. I don't know about you, but I think that's, that's gone. Maybe, maybe last century, but not now. I think that the, the, my vision of a great leader who is, let's define the five Bs of, of great leadership. Uh, five Bs of purposeful leadership. So the first B, you have to be clear about your purpose, your individual purpose in life, and be curious about the purpose of people around you and find a way to make sure that all connects with the work. The second thing is you have to be clear about your role as a leader. My view is that it's not to be the smartest person in the room. It's not to make sure that everybody knows how smart you are. It's to create an environment where everybody can blossom. The third B is you have to be clear about who you're serving. I told the the officers, the senior leaders at Best Buy, if you're here to serve yourself or your boss or me as the CEO of the company, it's okay, I don't have a problem with that, except you cannot and you should not work here. We're gonna promote you to customer and we'll take great care of you as customers. On the other hand, if you're here to serve you know, the organization and the frontliners, then we're good. The fourth B is about being, you know, it's about integrity, being values driven, that's foundational. And the fifth B is about you know, being authentic and being vulnerable, being yourself, being a human being. These are, I think five, certainly expectations I have of uh, ahead of leaders at Best Buy, and I think that uh, that helped us along the way. Awesome. Um, and the next question I want to touch base on is kind of this idea of leadership style. I know Mr. Jeff Weiner, who was the former CEO of LinkedIn, yeah. he describes his leadership style as being compassionate. So I'm curious, yeah. how would you describe your leadership style, and how did you develop it over time? Yeah, and, and Logan, I admire you for studying all of these leaders. Everybody, big round of applause listening to Logan. <laughs> You're so cool. Um, and so my leadership style evolved. I evolved from being a very analytical, hard-charging, you know, McKinsey consultant who wanted to tell people what to do. I was like that. I was, uh, I was trying to be, you know, I thought being smart was important to somebody now who believes in human magic. And so I think that, especially in this time of crisis, you know, the pandemic, you know, social unrest, uh, back to the office, there's no playbook for any of these things. 
right? And so I think in these times we've rediscovered our humanity, we've rediscovered the humanity of people in our care. So being, yes, being compassionate, I agree with, with them, this is very important. Empathy is very important. And then uh, humility and vulnerability. My most frequently used phrase now, Logan, is my name is Hubert and I don't know. Or my name is Hubert and I need help. And it's the truth. You know, if there is no playbook for, let's say, dealing with the pandemic, instead of pretending that you know, you got to say, okay, this is what we know. This is what we don't know. And this is how we're going to figure this out together. And so to quote another uh, CEO Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, he said, as leaders, we need to move from know it all to learn it all. And so humility, for me, I would highlight significantly. So you would say it's kind of be, the idea of always being a student, always yeah. learning something new. That's right. You've heard about IQ, right? Intellectual quotient. You've heard about EQ, emotional quotient. A friend of mine who talked who talks about LQ, the learning quotient, the ability to learn, and not just when we're students, but the, our entire life. And I think he's right in highlighting this. Yeah. And um, the last question before we end today's episode, Mr. Jolly, is I want I want to know what what drives you? What drives you to put your best foot forward to help people? Yeah, what drives me, what gives me energy. So if I have three criteria when I am considering doing something. I want to do something that's meaningful, that's impactful, and that's joyful. If I'm missing one of the three, ah, I'm not so excited. Now, meaningful is about you know, purpose. And as I said, my purpose in life is to try, I don't always succeed, but to try to make a positive difference on people around me and use the platform I have in a, to try to make a positive difference in the world. And um, for me today, that means that, you know, it's use everything I've learned and I continue to learn to help the next generation of leaders, you know, build a better future. Great. Mr. Zoli, thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge and wisdom of business and the human spirit. Based on the amazing reviews of your book from some of the top leaders in the world, you have ignited a new trend of empowering employees that lead to corporate success. It was a pleasure hearing your adventure. Thank you, Logan. Really enjoyed our conversation.